In this video, we'll continue to look at um, possible questions on um, atomic physics, nuclear physics, um, slash radioactivity. Now, in this video, we'll look at um, another possible question. This time, we'll look at this question from May, June 2015, question 1, right? So this is May, June 2015, question 1. Now, it says, the activity of a radioactive sample was measured over a 24-day period. The results are recorded in Table 1. So I've taken the liberty of actually completing, copying down Table 1 on the board. So um, at t equals 0 days, the activity was 40.0 disintegrations per second. After 4 days, 29.5. 8 days, 20.0. 12 days, 14.0. 16 days, 10.0. 20 days, 6.5. And after 24 days, the activity was... 5.0 disintegrations per second, right? Now, part A of the question says, plot a graph on page, well, plot a graph on page 3 of activity A versus time T, right? And of course, we're given the graph and we'd have been expected to choose our scales, right? So, obviously, um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing the diagram on the board which is not going to be ruled up as nicely as see in a graph paper. So, I've gone ahead and I've drawn my axes and I've plotted my points. Now, I'm using a scale of one inch to represent two days on the x-axis um, and a scale of two, inch, two inches to represent five disintegrations per second on the y-axis. I guess if you're using your graph paper, you could basically use the same scale, but of course, centimeters instead of inches, right? So on the, on the x-axis, you could use a scale of one centimeter to represent two days, and on the y-axis, two centimeters to represent five days. 0 0.0 disintegrations per second. Now, the fact that we're given the, the values correct to one decimal place, it means that we should actually reflect that on the, on the, on the disintegration axis as well, that is on the y-axis, right? So, if we're given it to one decimal place, we should actually represent that on the particular axis, right? So, I've plotted the points. Now, I will basically attempt to draw a smooth curve of best fit through these points. Right, so there we have um, as smooth a curve of best fit as I could possibly draw without actually having to draw it another time. Right, so there we have it. So, graph as a title, graph of activity versus time. We have our scale, our axes are labeled, and of course, we, um, we plotted our points and drawn our, our, our curve of best fit. And the total number of marks for that is eight, eight marks. So once you do all of that, you should be able to get your eight marks, right? Now let's continue. It says, part B says, using your graph, calculate the average half-life of the sample determined from the average of two or three values, right? So it says two or three. So that means if you do two, you should, and you do them properly, then you should get the full marks for this question, which of this part of the question, which is worth, let me see. Whoa, 12 marks. 12 a whopping 12 marks using your graph calculate the average half-life of the sample determined from the average of two or three values so to be on the safe side we'll try to do it three times right 12 marks whoa anyways so let's proceed to find the half-life so once again the half-life of any radioactive sample is a time taken, or in this case, the activity to decrease to half its initial value. At t equals zero days, the activity is 40.0. So in order to determine as many half-lives as possible, it is best to start with 40 as our initial, right, our initial activity. So after one half-life, we know the activity will be halved. So what we'll do is a half, locate a half of 40, which is 20, x in a horizontal line, which touches a curve, and then go across until it touches the x-axis so if you look at our tables we should see that the activity was 20 after eight days or 20.0 after eight days so this should actually drop at eight days but we still have to show it on the graph so we can get the full 12 marks right so we've do done that then we take our ruler and drop a vertical
right good and of course this first interval would be our first half life let's call it t half one right so from the graph we could say that from the graph so a equals 40 at t equals 0 and a equals 20 at t equals 8 days so therefore t half 1 is equal to 8 days right um we we need to uh, estimate at least one more half life but we'll do two then we're going to say a half of 20 that is 10 so we're going to locate 10 luckily for us there's already 10 on the on the list of values but we still have to show it on the graph right um so we draw a line across from 10 and that should meet our curve at the point we plotted and that will correspond to a time of 16 days right good and then this interval will be the second approximation of our half-life let's call that t half 2 right and so at a equals 10 when t equals 16 days and therefore t half 2 is equal to 16 minus 8 is equal to 8 days so the second approximation of our half-life is 8 days now let's do it a third time because of course we want to make sure we get our 12 marks right so a half of 10 would be now 5 and luckily for us once again that occurs at a nice number of 24 but we still have to take our or our, 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 our take our um um fix this right here we still have to take our ruler and show how we how we how we, how we get the value right So we go across until the line meets the curve. And then we drop a vertical until it meets, meets the x-axis. Right? So um, once again, we say that A equals 5.0 when T is equal to 24 days. And therefore, T half 3, so this, the third approximation of our half-life, would be 24 minus 16 equals 8 days and of course you could also show the interval on our graph as well so this would be t half 3 right so t half 3 t half 1 t half 3 good good and therefore now our average half life is 8 plus 8 plus 8 over 3 which gives us 8 days right so in even though each half life worked out to be 8 days again to ensure that we got our full 12 marks we showed that the average of 3 eighths is 8 so the average half life is 8 days and so if we do all of that then we should easily get our 8 marks right All right, so that was part B of the question. Part C says, use the graph to determine the activity of the sample after 25 days. So it says, use the graph to determine the activity of the sample after 25, 25? Yes, 25 days. All right, so where we have, this is what we're going to do now. We're going to use our scale on the time axis and we're going to locate 25. So 25 would be exactly between 24 and 26, which would be about there, right? And then we're going to use our ruler to draw a vertical line. We're going to use our ruler to draw a vertical line so it touches the curve. And then we're going to take our ruler and go across now to the, um, the y-axis. So from the point where it touches the curve, we're going to take our ruler and go across to the y-axis. 
Now again, I'm doing this on the board and I don't have the luxury of those very small squares on the graph paper. So mine won't be as accurate as yours possible could be, but I'm trying my best to make it as accurate as possible. Right? So we see that when you do that, right, when you do that, we see that it corresponds to something which is close to five, but is not yet five. Um, I think when I did it earlier on paper, I got something like 4.5, um, 4.5 um, disintegrations per second, right? So I could say that basically after 25, after 25 days, A equals 4.5 disintegrations per second. Good? So once again, if you're drawing this on graph paper, you will have the luxury of those very small squares and you'll be able to get um, something as more accurate than what I did on the board. But somewhere it should be between 4.5, not gonna be at five. Um, so I guess, um, you know, it, there might be an acceptable range for this given that no two students are likely to get the same exact value and it wouldn't necessarily make it wrong, right? So somewhere between 4.5 or probably 4.9 disintegrations per second. But when I drew it earlier, I got, um, see how much I got? It's estimated to be about, about, yeah, about 4.5 disintegrations per second, right? About 4.5 disintegrations per second. All right, so that's part C of the question. Now part D doesn't have anything to do with the graph, but says state two types of radioactive emissions. Um, instead of the two, we just list the three. In terms of radioactive emissions, we have alpha particle emission, right? Alpha particles are helium nuclei and are often represented like this. Sometimes you may see HE42 or you may see alpha42, right? So usually I write alpha42 because I guess when you see alpha, then there's no confusion as to what it means, whether it's an alpha particle or the helium atom, right? Because the alpha particle is a helium nucleus meaning that it has the protons and neutrons, but of course no electrons, right? So this is alpha particle. Then the next part of the question, um, well, the other type of emission would be beta particle emission. Beta particle, um, a, a, a beta particle is essentially a fast moving or a high speed electron. So sometimes you may see E, and this would be, the mass of course would be zero, and the charge would be minus one, or you may see the beta symbol and of course, minus one, zero, right? So beta particle, a fast moving electron, right? And of course, we just let the third type of radioactive emission, that would be a gamma ray, right? So a gamma ray is um, a thir the third type of um, radioactive emission that is usually symbol by the symbol gamma. Now, of course, he alpha particles are helium nucleus. They have two protons um, and two neutrons for a mass number of four. Beta particles are fast moving electrons, which of course you know as a charge of minus one. Um, gamma rays of course are short, very short wavelength electromagnetic radiation, right? So um, we'd have, you'd, have, you'd have done the electromagnetic spectrum, and of course you know gamma, GXU, VIMR. So gamma rays, X-rays, um, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves, right? So gamma rays are very short wavelength electromagnetic radiation right the last pass of the question says which of the which type of radioactive emission is the most dangerous to human tissue right so which type of radio which type of the radioactive emission is the most dangerous to human tissue right so of the three types of um, radioactive emissions gamma rays would be the most dangerous to human tissue because they are the most they are the most penetrative right um, alpha particles can be stopped by um, a few alpha particles they can be stopped by um, a few what am I talking about alpha 
alpha particles can be stopped by a few centimeters of, of even air and can be stopped by um, a few um, a, a thin sheet of paper and can even be stopped by the skin so alpha particles are not the most penetrative beta particles are more penetrative than alpha particles but of course less penetrative than gamma rays beta particles requires um, dense material like a, 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 a few thin sheets of aluminum to stop them so beta particles of course will pass through sheets of paper but of course be stopped by a thin sheet of metal or light metal like aluminum whereas when it comes to gamma rays gamma rays are not necessarily completely stopped by lead but of course are significantly reduced by lead right so once again gamma rays would be the most pen most penetrative of the three types of radioactive emissions and of course it will be the most dangerous to human tissue